Hey gang, welcome back again to Ken Tamplin Vocal Academy where the proof is in the singing. I am continuing a series that I think is really interesting and the series is called Replacement Singers, Who Did It Better? Now, in this case, I'm gonna be doing Nightwish and it may not be so much who did it better because it's just who did it different better and what was more appropriate for the time of the band and so forth. Now, before we get started, if you wouldn't mind, uh, please like and subscribe to my channel. That would be really cool. Don't forget to ring the bell so I can keep new uh, cool videos coming your way. I also have a singing course. I'm a master vocal coach and uh, you can find it right here at kentamplinvocalacademy.com where I have a singing forum also over there with over 25,000 singers all negotiating how to get great at singing. Singing. In this case, we're going to talk about some opera, which is bel canto or appoggio, uh, and then some hard rock, some belting, and some pop singing, etc. Because it's very diverse. So this is a tough one for me because these, the nuance and the difference of all the different styles that they integrate into their sound is pretty unique. Now. I want to say that they are sort of hailed as being the first real symphonic metal band, and that's actually really not true. I mean, we had a couple other bands, you know, Therian from Sweden, uh, we had Rhapsody from Italy, and even before that, back in 85, um, Dream Theater, you know, I'd sort of consider them as symphonic metal or just, you know, progressive metal, whatever, kind of symphonic. But the thing that makes Nightwish interesting for me is their melodic value as well as their instrumentation. So they're not just dark, you know, kind of morose, macabre, dark, you know, everything's minor pentatonic scaly kind of things. Um, they added a lot of interesting pop sensibilities. So without much further ado, I just want to dive right in. Now, I chose... Again, remember we have a criteria for this, and the criteria is is that first, the original singer, you know, it's really hard to make a band successful, so the original singer gets kudos for that. Uh, did the replacement singer step in and fill the shoes of the original singer? Um, what contribution did they make creatively? How long did they last, and did they continue to go on after they left the band, right? And it's kind of a weird criteria here because, <laughs> you know, we're gonna discuss this in a minute. All right, so the other thing is, is that it's not really fair to grade everybody on just a couple of clips that some publishing companies graced me and allowed me to use on YouTube um, because we can't always find the best clips of the singer. So I really tried to be careful uh, and use the best material I could find and also not like have some aggressive metal, power metal thing on one side and then from one singer and then a ballad from another. I try to keep it really fair and, and pull out the best of the best of what they did. So gonna get started. Now we have Tarya right here. Now Tarya is singing Phantom of the Opera. I've talked about this before, but what I want to say about this is later I learned that she actually was sick when she sang this, and that's phenomenal um, in my opinion. But let's dive into this because this is really interesting. Check this out. Cool. I'm going to stop there. Now, this is what makes this band so unique um, because symphonic metal comes from the word symphony, as we know. And when I think of a symphony, I think of the opera, of course. And so they start out, give a song to me, right? So she's got a very appoggio, very bel canto operatic approach to her singing, right? As does Fleur. Now, there are a lot of things I could do to break down these vowels and talk about all the analytics of singing and so forth, the technicality of it, but I do wanna cover a little bit of this because I wanna talk about why this is fascinating because a lot of symphonic metal bands have gone to the sound, okay? Most of the time, or typically, metal bands have been notorious for belting, belting and wailing. And this is kind of the antithesis of that. Now, this is also important to note for you ladies out there that are interested in this, 
Back in the 1700s, 1800s, and early 1900s, the soprano was instructed not to belt in her upper mid register because most of the arias and things that were written for sopranos or for pieces that involved sopranos high C, which is called the C6, um, was you know relegated around not pulling up so much chest in a sound focusing on their reinforced falsetto or their head voice sound in order to be able to free themselves up to get to the high C. And what is the high C? So here is a tenor C right here. You know, that's the tenor C. And the female, I mean, it's, I'm not in, in voice. I actually warm up to that almost every day, but it's, it's way up there. It's this note. Okay, so, so the goal for the soprano was to get to this note effortlessly and not over sing the lower mid voice in order to be able to accommodate that. So we hear that clearly here, and I don't know her operatic background. Obviously she's had some training or at least delved into it quite a bit. And so you hear, you hear a lot of the, Right. Here's some really pure uh, bel canto vowels. So I'm assuming she's had a fair amount of bel canto training. And the other thing is, is that um, you're gonna find that she kind of mixes it up a little bit as we go with trying to integrate some belting and whatnot. And and I want to hear that. So let's check it out. Now. Right. She goes down into a chest voice and she kind of mixes as she comes down. I can hear some dysphonia in the chords like she's had some sinus issues and you can hear that coming through the mixed voice and I don't have time to break all that down, but you can hear it. And so when someone said she was sick, that made sense. But I gotta say this guys, I teach in my course and to everybody that we actually sing through colds and flu. Now, we don't give our best performances necessarily through colds and flu, but if we carefully and understand how to sing through colds and flu, we can maintain the quality, integrity, and stamina and whatnot of our voices so that we don't take two or three weeks off and then have to recover our voices, etc. It comes at about 70% capacity of our abilities and then boom, it's right back at 100%. As soon as the cold and flu is gone, it doesn't, our voices don't go away and we get hoarse and lose them. So she, you can hear this as you're going through this. So. Good intonation. Now, the other thing about this that's a little odd for me as I'm going through this is this is a little more on the theatrical side of opera. It's not true bel canto, and of course bel canto is in Latin, or in, in Italian, excuse me, and, or Latin. And um, so she's modifying a lot of her vowel sounds into English, but she's also treating the over enunciation of the words more like Broadway or theater. True bel canto would not do that. So I wanna make a distinction of that as you're going through this because it makes it a little, I don't want to use the word sappy, but it's just, it's more theater. You know what I mean? It's, it's just that. So anyway, I, I have, by the way, I just have to be honest. Is she killer? Gang, these ladies are awesome. So I am not here to degrade them in any way. I'm just making vocal coach comments along the way so that we can all understand who did it better. Okay, let's continue. I love this guy's voice. Now, what was interesting is, is he is he brought in some chest, yeah, you know, some belting sound. He made her sound a lot tougher than she really is in this register. But it's cool because it was done tastefully, and you know, it's just it's nice. It works. Now, I gotta keep making comments, folks. In the lower register, because most 
conductors, maestros, vocal coaches for opera, particularly for the soprano voice. And you ladies out there are gonna really, really identify this. I wanna be able to belt. I wanna be able to have a powerful voice, a, a rock belting voice. You can hear that she has not developed this because she relies predominantly on her head voice, bringing her head voice down. And this is a typical thing that has been taught in appoggio, in operatic uh, training, that they don't over sing the lower or mid voice sections because it's all about hitting this C6, this soprano high C. So they sacrifice at the altar um, their mid voice or their, uh, sorry about that, the mid voice. And what happens is, is that they have no power or strength, right? Because they never worked that part of their voice. Now she has some, and we're gonna get to that in a minute, but I have to point this out because who did it better? Let's check for this sound, and maybe this is better. Check it out. See? Oh, hi, everything's down here. It's getting so, oh, hi. Right, she's gonna be able to go up in her upper register and throw down pretty hard because that's where her voice starts humming and it resides with more power. But she, yeah, yeah. She can't do any of that because she's never developed that sound, okay? Very, very important. Let's continue. Now this is, it's, it's, that's where her, she starts humming, right? Now I wanna shut up now, sorry, and I will. Shut up, back up, and let her do her thing. Here we go. get into it now that was pretty killer and I, and I would have loved to have pulled some ghost love score and some other stuff into this absolutely polar opposites enter Annette Olsen okay so here we just came off of Phantom of the Opera some great bel canto uh, great you know belting screaming you know combined with some operatic vocal stuff and then and then basically ABBA the band ABBA walks in right and that's not necessarily a bad thing because this album is really good. In fact, I gotta go as far as to say something. And I, you know, people may or may not like this and it's my opinion, I'm allowed, I'm allowed to have it. I am blown away. I know this band has had tremendous success. I know they did, oh gosh, why they have like, uh, selling more nine, 9 million records. I think they had 60 gold, gold or platinum albums. I forget if all, the, all this data escapes me. Like having, you know, six number one singles. I mean, this band has been probably the biggest symphonic metal band that's ever existed, on the one hand. On the other hand, I don't think they've gone anywhere near the credit that they deserve because they've combined some of the toughest elements. Now think about this. So. Everyone is expecting you to be tough and you're coming from, you know, a, a, um, a country that is, you know, really heavy and there's some melodic stuff, but, but, you know, a lot of the really heavy, heavy metal stuff has come from the North, Sweden, you know, Norway, Sweden, Iceland, all these different places and Finland in this case, but, um, and so Europe in general, but, um, all of a sudden you start combining this really, really melodic sound. So you got really heavy and real melodic, right? Check this out, really interesting bedfellow. Okay, now, I'm gonna get to this in a minute. 
amaranth and and of course you know uh, story time right i wish i had more time to do that because because i love floor jansen's version of story time but um anyway and i didn't i didn't get a chance to put this on so i encourage you guys to go out and really peruse through some of their stuff my first impression on this was that she really can't sing live that great she's a studio production I'm sorry, Annette, I'm just being honest. Don't be mad. Your studio stuff was awesome. In fact, I think that's their best record was the records that you've made, the music that you made with them. Um, so from a melodic standpoint and a creative standpoint, again, we've got to do the criteria. What's, what are our filters? Did Annette step up to the plate and fill um, Tarja's shoes? Absolutely, but in a different, a completely different kind of way. She brought in a pop element that the band didn't have and was, you know, the, with what, what happened with Tarya is it was more old school, you know, kind of old dated school kind of stuff. Um, so she brought in this really cool, fresh element. And in the studio, she crushed it for that kind of sound. On stage, she doesn't have a lot of stage presence for me. When I, when I, when I go look at Tarya, I'm like, that's a rock star. You know what I mean? And she's very mysterious and just very confident, whatever. Here, you know, her clothes, the way she carries herself. Meh, you know, so it's weird because the album, maybe the best album they made is with her, probably, in my opinion, just listening to through their stuff. But does it translate with her live? And I think that's really important. So we talked about that too. Was it studio? Was it live? What kind of performers were they? Did they step at the plate? No, I don't think she did. I, I don't think she's as good as, as either Tarya or Floor. But 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 in the song department, it's killer. Excuse me. I mean, again, good stuff, but it kind of like, I feel like I'm looking at a rehearsal or something. I'm not getting any charisma out of that. I wish he'd hired a clothes designer, you know, or, or at least, you know, wardrobe director to come in. I wish they'd had some kind of choreographer to come in and, and show her where to stand, how to move, how to look, or she should have taken some pictures of herself. So I'm just not impressed at all with the life part of this. And the band's killer. Okay, now, <laughs> wow. When Fleur comes on the stage, and she just did, and we're about to hear some stuff, Fleur comes on, and she's got a lot of the elements of Tarya. And she's got a lot of the elements, again, as I go through this, guys, you know, stay with me on this, because I'm really trying to be fair about this, and I know there's a lot of love for Tarya, and, and, I, and I'm sorry she's not in the band, and I know Annette's not in the band, I'm, so, I'm sorry that, that, that they went through member changes. But maybe kind of for the better from a live standpoint, because she combines both of the other two singers. She had a really tough gig. She had the, the, the most popular songs coming from an ABBA kind of sound. And then she had this operatic thing. She had to feel, wow, that's a big shoe. And then she's got to be able to look cool on stage and take that up a notch as well. Did she, did she score? Let's check it out. Here we go. This is the end of it. Now. Sorry. Beautiful melody. Okay, now, remember we talked about how sopranos are trained, though she can belt, but she kind of chooses not to. Check this out. Let me go back a minute. Hold on a second. Let me just back this up. And I, I'm not going to overstate this and I'm not going to play any favorites, but I do want to point this out. It's really, who's better, right? Check it out. End of Annette. Sorry, it's my bad. Here we go. So she's, we used to say, you know, she's real sweet on it. She's not going, we to say, you know, she's not, you know, or we used to sing. She's not doing that either, right? She's combining the pop elements of Annette and she's, and she's kind of moving into the sweetness of a pop version. And I know she's, she is operatically trained, but a pop version of, uh, of Tarya, right? So interesting, I think. 
and it has a great song and a great band to back it up. Cool, right? Then, as, the, as we move on here, check this out. Cool, as she's standing there, she looks like a rock star. She's comfortable in her skin. She's not moving around much, though she does do that on story time. <laughs> she's gonna get a whiplash from that. Anyway, um, so, um, and, and she's, you know, she's just got a lot of charisma, a lot of mystery, like Tarya. She had a lot of charisma, a lot of mystery. Cool stuff. Great intonation and pitch. Now, to me, to me, she's staying with that operatic thing, but then she does this. You're not gonna get any of that out of Tarya and you're not gonna get any of that out of Annette, right? So, pretty cool, man. Now she's in a chest voice, a belted chest voice. Back to head voice. Chest voice. Chest. I mean, she's kind of adding everything, if you ask me. So. I kind of think my favorite is Fleur out of all of it. I think maybe the, again, let's recap, guys. You tell me your thoughts, man. You put your thoughts in, in the comment sections. I would say Taria for that blood-curdling, goose-bumpy feel, though that was pretty good right there at the end of Phantom of the Opera when Taria was throwing down. I think I got more otherworldly charisma, energy, wow, goosebump factor from her, from Taria. I think Annette gave me more pop sensibilities of catchy pop songs, though some of this stuff is absolutely incredible. Like I said, I wish you could play story time and stuff, because there's some good stuff. Then there's a lot, look, Ghost Loves Girl. I didn't, get, I didn't get a chance to go through all of this stuff, but I, I wanted to point this one out. But, um, but I think for combining everything and for what the band needed and to bring all of that together, you tell me, I, think, I guess my personal favorite would probably have to be Fleur, but I can't discount the rest. So I've got to trust on your guys' thoughts. You guys know way more about the band than I do, especially people who are you know, Nightwish, Nightwish uh, super fans. But anyway, I look forward to your thoughts and comments and definitely check out my next video.